Psalm 24, 1, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Okay, so Ephesians, we're in chapter 4, working our way. We've been through Philippians, here we are in Ephesians, soon we'll be in Colossians, we'll kind of combine that with Philemon. Those are the uh, four letters we'll be looking at, Paul's prison epistles. Um, he did write 2 Timothy from prison. Uh, and that would be his second imprisonment right prior to his execution. But we're covering these four. Now, when we get done with this, I've really been praying through this. And uh, we're going to look at the book of Revelation. And we're going to take a very responsible look at it. Folks, the way you study Scripture, any doctrine, any teaching of Scripture, you read Scripture in light of Scripture. You don't take Scripture out of context. That's what cult leaders do. Um, so when Jesus in Matthew 24 and 25 talks about the signs of his second coming, yes, you read that, but you also look at the prophecies throughout the Old Testament. You look what's said in the book of Daniel, which some scholars call the revelation of the Old Testament. You look in First and Second Thessalonians, which are heavy on the doctrine of the second coming of Christ. And then, of course, you look in Revelation as well. And so we won't be setting any dates or times or anything like that. Um, but we will just take a good look at it because Paul said in uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 as he began talking about uh, the last trumpet and um, uh, we will, uh, the dead in Christ will rise first. He gets through with that and he says, therefore, encourage one another with these words. And I uh, started going to church in 1978 and I was in high school. But that was on the tail end of what was called the Jesus Movement. Uh, back when they baptized thousands of hippies in the Pacific Ocean. It's when uh, praise and worship music uh, began to begin, just these scripture choruses. It was an awesome time. And I'm really glad I kind of got in on the end of that. But one of the things that they really loved studying was about the second coming of Christ. And I'll get into all this again, but I believe with all my heart. The number, for me, the number one strongest sign that God is in, in his final steps of moving the chess pieces into place is that on May 14th, 1948, Israel, for the first time in 2,500 years, became a recognized nation on planet Earth. To this day, Israel, the Temple Mount, is the geopolitical hotspot of the entire world. You look at Israel on your globe, you can hardly find it, right? But everything sort of begins and ends there. It is an amazing thing. In fact, I think it was Prime Minister Netanyahu, or was it Sharon? I think it was Sharon, who said the Temple Mount is the most volatile square kilometer on the planet. So we'll get into all of that. That's just sort of a little preview. But as I always like to do, let's laugh a little bit, shall we? Come on, I gotta turn this on. Yeah. So the lady on the left, my child only eats organic food. Here's the watch song. Oh, my kids eat Cheerios off the floor with the dog. <laughs> only Macy. <laughs> <laughs> only the third kid. Hey, no lie. Uh, the in-laws came over. They're sleeping in one of the rooms. They're getting the bed out. I found a Cheerio. <laughs> Thank you. I don't even know what year it's from. <laughs> All right, folks, let's get into this, shall we? So Ephesians chapter 4, we're going to try to go verses 1 through 16. If I only get through point one, we'll cover point two next week. How about that? So, Paul writing from prison, he says, As a prisoner for the Lord, then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling that you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. So he's sort of kind of describing what that calling to the Christian life means. Be completely humble and gentle, be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Now let me offer this one thing parenthetically. I've been in more than one church where they voted unity over truth. That is not what Paul is writing. It is not what the Bible intends. In other words, let's just keep the peace by suppressing part of the truth. Never, ever allow that to happen. 
always stand up, even if you're in the minority. Okay, so there is one body. Now, right here, Paul's going to list the word one seven times. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Point number one, fill in your blanks, there are not many ways to God. For all those people, especially in our, quote, tolerant society in North America, there is not many ways to God. All religions are not the same. You see the quote on the screen. All religions do not point to the God of the Bible. All religions do not say that all religions are the same. At the heart of every religion as is an uncompromising commitment to a particular way of defining who God is or is not and accordingly of defining life's purpose. Anyone who claims that all religions are the same betrays not only an ignorance of all religions, but also a caricatured view of even the best known religions. Every religion at its core is exclusive. So for those who would just pop off and say, hey, we all worship the same God, they're insulting all religions. Every religion is exclusive. So let's compare what the Bible says to just a few of the primary religions, the world religions, that are somewhat familiar to us, at least the, the titles. Mm -hmm. Now I'm going to read these to you. You might want to write down, I just don't have room on your handout, but Hindu, what are they, we're not going to do an exhaustive um, explanation of all these. Just one or two basic contradictions. They do believe and teach that there are many ways to God. Now, their God is not the God of the Bible, but they will teach you that there are many ways. Their primary gods are Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva. But they also propose or assure us, assert, that there are as many as 330 million gods little g. And you may think, well, that sounds inclusive. Well, not at all. What they're saying is our religion states there are many gods. If you don't believe there are many gods, you are excluded from our religion. Catch that? So it is, by its very nature, exclusive. Many ways to God. However, the Bible says in John 14, 6, recording Jesus, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. Buddhism, works-based religion as is most religions. Remember, Christianity is not a religion. God doesn't like religion any more than the world, this legalistic mindset. Christianity is a relationship with the God of the universe through Jesus Christ. It is, it is completely something upside down. It's something only God could have thought up. But Buddhism is a works-based religion. They have their what's called the eightfold path or way. This, these eight different, well actually it's, they've got four basic fundamentals and part of that is the eightfold path. But it's all of these steps and rules you must um, accomplished in order to reach what they call nirvana or this place of absolute, this state of absolute peace. On the contrary, Paul wrote, as we studied just a few weeks back in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, For by grace are you saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God. You don't earn a gift. You just receive it. It's not from works so that no one can boast. Listen, the only thing we can boast about is the cross of Jesus Christ, right? Jesus did the work, all the work that was possible. It was impossible for us to ever 
ever earn our way to heaven. By grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. And this was the cry of the reformers, Martin Luther and uh, Zwingli and uh, John Knox and John Wycliffe, all those people back in the 15th and 16th centuries, those, those five solas, sola grati, by grace alone, sola fide, by faith alone, solus Christus, in Christ alone, man. Don't let anybody tell you that you have to keep a list and check off the boxes to be good enough for God. We can't be good enough for God, ever. We blew that in Eden. <laughs> Our position in Christ, that we are right and holy before God, was accomplished on the cross through the fixed and finished work of Jesus Christ. And that's precisely why he said, it is finished, man. John 6, 63, Jesus said, look, forget that nirvana stuff. The spirit alone gives eternal life. Human effort accomplishes nothing. John 6, 63. So Buddhism also denies the existence of a personal God. In other words, not only do they not uh, uh, proclaim the God of the Bible, they don't believe that you can even know really what God is or who God is. It's just this kind of uh, cosmic uh, clock worker who just sort of wound up the clock and stepped away. And There's no way we can know him. But John chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, and then verse 14, written by the eyewitness disciple John. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made. Which referring to Christ here, but in Genesis 1.1, we read, In the beginning God created, and that's John's point. Jesus is God. And then in verse 14, and this word, who is God, became human and made his dwelling among us. And we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son, from the Father, full of grace and truth. Now, anybody who wants these notes later on, I will email them to you, glad to give them to you. I don't ever mind doing the work and just giving you the stuff. But I want to equip you so that if someone sits down and just says, that, you know, there are many ways to God, all you have to say is, well, a lot of people think that, but that's not what the Bible teaches. See, it's not our opinion. It's kind of like uh, marriage. It's, the Bible doesn't teach traditional marriage. It teaches biblical marriage. Mm -hmm. Put it on God, man. Mm -hmm. It's his plan. Mm -hmm. And we just abide by it because we understand that the Bible is true. Mm -hmm. And that there's more evidence, compelling and overwhelming, for the Bible being true than any other belief system in the planet or on the planet. Well, Judaism. Now, this is an interesting thing because it was it was through the Jews that the Messiah was given to us, right? Well, why did God choose the Jews? Great question. He had to choose somebody. That's all that is. He chose the Jews. So. Jesus was Jewish, so those people who think that Jesus was some white, um, you know, conservative wearing a MAGA hat, not at all, not at all true. Jesus wasn't even uh, Anglo. He was Jewish, grew up in the ancient agrarian Jewish culture there in Palestine. Uh, it must have been incredible to watch that guy grow up. So the Jews, of course, rejected Jesus, right? They, not all, but most of them said, you're not the Messiah. They rejected the prophecies of the Old Testament. So Orthodox Jews, now not all Jews, some Jews have come to faith in Christ. And it's incredible visiting with them because they have all the insight into the Jewish culture. The uh, Lord's Supper that we observe is based on what God gave to the Jews. They're uh, in, uh, just before they were liberated from Egyptian bondage. But it changed from Passover to the Last Supper because of the New Covenant. We now observe it in remembrance of the Messiah and his sacrifice, right? But the Jews, the Orthodox Jews, rejecting Jesus as Messiah, only regard the Old Testament as credible. 
or valid. In fact, it's called the Jewish Bible. They have disregarded or rejected the entire New Testament. But this is interesting. The Bible says in Luke 24, verses 6 through 7, the risen Jesus has now appeared to these men on their way to Emmaus. They don't recognize him. He's walking along with them. Now, this is an interesting <laughs> idea. I know people have had encounters with angels. I know that. I believe with all my heart I did when I was in college. I wonder if sometimes Jesus unrecognized just walks alongside of us. I know that almost sounds heretical, but he's walking alongside of them and they don't recognize him. And he opens their eyes and he said, did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? Because they're very upset. They, all these Jews thought that the Messiah was coming to liberate them from Roman oppression. And if you've watched, if you've had the chance to watch the, um, uh, the online series called The Chosen, if you haven't, boy, I would highly recommend it. It's outstanding. Very, very responsible uh, way to tell the story of Jesus. But they hated the Romans. It would be like if another nation conquered us and well, I had two guards right back here making sure we were teaching nothing but what the state um, approved, watching our every move, heavily taxing us so that we hardly had anything to eat. It was an oppressive time. And so they all thought the Messiah, this king who was coming, was going to liberate them and just crush the Romans. But he didn't. Jesus claiming to be the Messiah actually wound up being killed like a criminal, right? They, and they couldn't reconcile this in their mind. And so these two men on the way to Emmaus are saying, I did, it, 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 he can't do it. What happened? This guy worked miracles, but they still killed him. He couldn't save himself. And then Luke goes on to write in chapter 24, verses 6 and 7. Jesus, and beginning with Moses, the first five books of the Bible, and all the prophets, Isaiah, Daniel, Zephaniah, Zechariah, Hosea, Nahum, and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. So, those who would say the New Testament is invalid, <laughs> Jesus explained himself using only the Old Testament scriptures. So now let's look at Islam. Um, Nabil Qureshi, the late Nabil Qureshi, I hate to say, he died very young of stomach cancer. Uh, but he had accepted the challenge. He was an Orthodox Muslim. But he accepted the challenge um, to at least investigate the claims of Christ. His testimony is recorded in his book, Seeking Allah, Finding Jesus. It is a powerful story. And through his investigation, he came to faith in Christ. Mm -hmm. It cost him mm -hmm. greatly in regard to his family, but he was willing to pay the price. During one of my classes uh, in grad school, World Religions, one of the assignments was to visit a worship service of a religion other than Christianity. So, I decided to sit in on a prayer service with a local Islamic mosque. So I called them and um, left a message. They finally got back to me and they said, that'll be fine. And so I went for the men's evening prayer service. And um, out of respect, removed my shoes as I, as I went in. There was a man sitting there reading the Quran. And uh, I just went over to the side as the men began, began to arrive. Now the Imam, I-M-A-M, he's up at the front up here and he's leading uh, the quoting of the Quran and the different traditions. The men are about three rows out here, bowing, standing up. Uh, and it was interesting. And so I sat to the side and afterwards, uh, two men, uh, one a successful businessman, another a physician, sat down with me for almost two hours and we just talked. Um, 
And I want you to know these people were precious people. You don't have to be afraid of anybody. In fact, here's one thing. My first question was, explain to me ISIS. And immediately, the physician said, ISIS is to Islam as the KKK is to Christianity. All of a sudden, it made sense. So every faith-based belief system has its extremists, right? Those who, as though, who have never read uh, their sole source for authority, whatever that may be for us being the Bible. There's being the Quran. So we know they have the five pillars. Uh, one of them is their um, pilgrimage to Saudi Arabia, uh, to uh, go to Mecca. And the, another is the five times of prayer during the day when I went to Morocco on a mission trip. Boy, those sirens, not sirens, but those speakers blared five times a day as a call to prayer. Um, but here's the thing about Islam. Allah, their word for God, is revealed as the one sovereign God over the entire universe. Allah's role as an omnipresent, omniscient, and omnipotent creator of the universe is heavily emphasized in the Quran. So far, so good, right? The Quran includes commandments to worship God. It states that God created everything in six days and that Jesus was born of a virgin. It still sounds pretty good, right? At first glance, one might conclude that the God of Muhammad and the God of the Bible are the same, but the conclusion would be completely and absolutely wrong. Islam teaches that Jesus was a uh, respected prophet, but not God. John 1.18, the Bible says, God has revealed him Christ and brought him out where he can be seen. He has interpreted, Jesus has interpreted God and he has made God known. This is incredible because the word revealed or interpreted is the Greek word from which we get exegesis. Now exegesis is a, um, a principle of study not really only into the scriptures, but in any type of reading or study. It is drawing out it, through a, a number of uh, principles of biblical interpretation uh, so that the word of God begins to, well, as I heard one person say, I used to read the scriptures in black and white, now it's though I'm reading them in color. Uh, it all of a sudden brings everything to life, this exegesis. And so that's what Jesus did. He exegeted the Father and said, here's... Here's the Father. I am God. It's an amazing thing. And that's why Jesus told Philip on the night before Jesus would be crucified in that upper room. Because Philip said, he's a normal human being. He's still trying to get it, even though he's walked around with Jesus for years. He said, Lord, show us the Father and we'll be satisfied. And Jesus replied, I'm sure lovingly. Have I been with you all this time, Philip, and yet you still don't know who I am? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. So why are you asking me to show him to you? Listen, if anybody wants to know what God is like, and they get wrapped up in those Old Testament, God telling, uh, commanding the, uh, the execution of the Canaanites and so forth and so on, say, look, maybe we can study all that later. But right now, if you want to know who God is, look at Jesus. Simple, simple answer. Jesus is God. Not only does the Bible say it, but it says it in principle as well. The Pharisees knew the Old Testament law. And so they tried to kill Jesus. Why? Because that was the penalty for claiming to be God. In John 5, 18, John wrote, the Jewish leaders wanted to kill Jesus because Jesus not only broke the Sabbath, but he called God his Father, thereby making himself equal with God. In Mark chapter 2, you remember the men who uh, started knocking out the ceiling and lowered that uh, paralytic? Can you imagine all of a sudden that insulation starts falling on us? I mean, what that must have looked like as they had such drive that they knocked out the ceiling of this guy's house. I don't know if he had insurance or whatever, you know. But 
What's interesting is that Jesus didn't look at him and say, you're healed. You remember what he said? Mm -hmm. Your sins are forgiven. Now, was Jesus saying he was God? Not as a statement, but the Pharisees said, what is he saying? Only God can forgive sins. Mm -hmm. Bingo. So it's throughout the Bible that we are told and shown that Jesus is God. According to the Quran, Muslims are not even sure until the day of judgment whether they'll be spending eternity in heaven or hell. However, John, that disciple, later in 1 John 5, 11 and 12 said, and this is what God has testified. He has given us eternal life and this life is in his son. He who has the son has the life. Who, whoever does not have the son does not have the life. Folks, we can know. We don't have to fear death. We can know. It's an amazing, wonderful, wonderful thing we have in the Christian faith. Obviously, too, uh, Islam is a works-based religion. In fact, uh, the Quran says in Surah 10, 109, uh, that if the Muslim, someone of Islam, doesn't make it, if they don't keep the five pillars or so, it's his own fault. Quote, whoever goes astray, he himself bears the whole responsibility of wandering. That's a responsibility we can't bear. Perfection is something we cannot bear. Right. I've talked about the Mormon faith and my visit with the Mormon missionaries and how every couple of years they have to go through what's called a temple recommend. And it is a checking off the boxes as they are interviewed. Have you done this? Have you done that? No, well, you're not allowed in the temple then, that temple which is located right over close to my house. What a horrible way to exist, to feel like God just doesn't quite love you enough. And then to check off those boxes, and the next day you get up, you just start all over again. Absolutely impossible. In fact, that was the, the objective, the goal, the purpose of the Old Testament law. Paul talks about that at length in Galatians. It was to serve as a reflection, a mirror, as we look deep into it and see how imperfect we are. You know those ladies' mirrors that, that, that magnify your head? You look like a mascot, right? And you see down into, through your pores, down to your <laughs> internal organs almost, you know? Anyway, but that's what it was. That was the Old Testament law. It was to show us that we cannot earn our way to God. The Bible is replete. The only sin, the un only unpardonable sin is unbelief. In John 1, 11, Jesus came to his own people and even they rejected him, but to all who believed him and accepted him, he gave the right to become children of God. And you know this one, John 3, verses 14 through 16. So the man, of, son of man must be lifted up so that anyone who believes in him will have eternal life. For this is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only son. That whosoever would what? Believe. Believe in him. Folks, it's by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. That logo's up there. You ever seen that bumper sticker? Mm -hmm. Folks, let me just stop there for a minute. And I can already tell you, we're not going to get to point two. I'll have those same things back there next week. And if you want to keep yours and bring it back, let's do that. Every time I see this bumper sticker, in my mind I go, absolutely, but coexist does not mean co-agree. Co Do not impose your convictions on me. I promise not to impose mine on you. It is arrogant, myopic, and uh, to use a trendy term, intolerant. it's intolerant to assume you're right mm -hmm. and everybody else is wrong. So even the coexist thing is exclusive, mm -hmm. kind of like Hinduism, because coexist, the way they're interpreting it is there are many ways to God. If you don't believe that, you're That's wrong. Right. That's what they're saying. Let me tell you something about truth. There cannot, <laughs> it's impossible to have multiple truths. Now think about this logically and philosophically. If I said there is only one truth, it's God's word, and somebody got in my face and said, how dare you? There are 
multiple truths. Oprah Winfrey, it was uh, 2000, I don't know, a couple of years ago, uh, 2018, I believe. It was in the Golden Globe Awards. And she got up and she said, I, I don't have the exact quote, I have it at my office. But may you all follow your truth. There's no such thing as your truth. To claim that there are many truths, if I tell you, folks, there are many truths, what have I just claimed? A truth claim. In other words, I've said the truth is that there are many truths. So you look at someone who says there are many truths and you're going, are you telling me the truth is that there are many truths? And they're going to look at you like, never thought of it that way, but I guess I am. So they're making a truth claim. So they're saying they're right and everybody else is wrong. There can't be multiple truths. That's why Jesus said, I am the way, the what? Truth. The truth and the life. Right. We don't impose our truth on anyone. We're ready to share it. We're going to live it out. But we're not going to impose it. And Jesus never did either. Mm -hmm. You remember the story of the rich young ruler? This is not a parable. This is recorded as narrative history. And that man came up and he said, Jesus, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Works-based, right? Which boxes do I need to check off to make sure I'm right with God? Now, Jesus knows this guy already, obviously. Jesus is God. He knows the guy's heart. And he knows he's very materialistic. And he looks at him. And first, he says, keep the commandments. Boy, a, he's trapped the guy. The guy says, I've kept them all. Well, he's already broken the one right there and says, thou shalt not bear false witness. The guy's lied. And so he's proven, even though he doesn't get it, that he is incapable of being right before God by human effort. But then Jesus just gets to the heart of this man's matter. And he says, look, if you want to follow me, sell your stuff. Give it to the poor and come and follow me. If Jesus had looked at me that day, he may have made another. Well, it wouldn't be about wealth, I can tell you that right now. But it'd be about something, issues in my heart that I had placed before him. If it were you, you can think of things that you struggle with. And he'd look at you and say, you know what? Take that away. Release that and come and follow me. But here's what I want you to see. It says... And the man walked away sad. What I want you to notice is that Jesus did not walk mm -hmm. toward him and try to talk him into following him. Jesus didn't impose himself on anyone. He simply boldly and fearlessly spoke and stood up for the truth and left the decision to us. That's why Joshua said, choose you this day who you will serve. Chip and Joanna Gaines, you know the HGTV thing, um, Fixer Upper? Um, obviously, they are Christians. They're devoted Christians. They live in Waco. And um, as anybody, if, at celebrity status, well, you become a target, right? Mm -hmm. They're going to dish up, those guys are going to dish up anything they can in the media and social media to make their news entertainment worthy. And so they dug and they, they saw that Chip and Joanna Gaines go to a... Uh, a church with a sound biblical worldview, sound biblical teaching, uncompromised, and that uh, they're um, that they denounced same-sex marriage. So, boy, here they come. These celebrities, everybody loves, man. They are intolerant. Chip Gaines stood up and said, "Don't you dare ever assume that disagree means hate." So, when someone comes up to you and says, "You are fill in the blank phobic," This number one, you say, look, your problem's not with me, it's with Jesus That's Christ. Right. And number two, right. don't you judge me right. as hating you in any way. One of my favorite quotes is by Rick Warren, the former pastor of Saddleback Church in Southern California. He said, our culture has accepted two huge lies. The first is that if you disagree with someone's lifestyle, you must fear or hate them. The second is that to love someone 
means you agree with everything they believe or do. Both are nonsense. You don't have to compromise convictions to be compassionate. When Jesus said love one another, he was not implying that agreeing with one another was a prerequisite. Jesus had the ability to profoundly disagree with people while simultaneously profoundly loving and caring for them. So don't let them bait you. One blogger wrote about those who are, I have found in my own experience, those who preach tolerance and judge everyone else as bigoted and hateful, they are the most bigoted, mm -hmm. hateful, intolerant mm -hmm. people. As one blogger wrote, he said about those who don't just want freedom for their view, but aggressively, in other words, they just they don't only want to be able to preach their religion, so to speak, without being persecuted, but they aggressively try to impose their view on others. In other words, they want you not only to allow them to live their life, they want you to celebrate mm -hmm. the way they live a life. Folks, I'm not going to do it. Jesus didn't do it. But you don't have to leave here going, all right, man, I'm going to go out there. You still love them. Mm -hmm. Listen, disagreement does not mean hate. Yeah. Now, the media narrative will tell you that's it because that's they, what they want to um, perpetuate. You just love them. And then it confuses them. Listen, I'll, I'll finish with this story. As you can imagine, uh, let's see, I was in, I was a full-time youth pastor for just almost 25 years. That's why my hair's white. <laughs> um, listen, I call it the wild kingdom. It was, it was incredible. It was an amazing, amazing thing. And then since then, all those kids have grown up. They're, they're adults now. They have their own children and their own lives. Listen, my first uh, church started in March of 1983. Michael Jackson had just come out with his Thriller album, all right? And I had the moves, folks. I could do that, you know, uh, thing. And so... <laughs> But they've grown up and they have their own lives and, you know, about, I don't know, a few years ago, I got a call from one of those former youth. Now, because I was so young, I was 19 when I started my first church. Um, he's now probably, see, I'm 59, he's in his 50s because he was in my youth group at one of those first, first years. But he called me. And said, man, let's have, let's have some coffee. Well, okay, you had me at coffee, so let's go do that. So we sat down one morning and just had the best time getting caught up. I had not visited with him in forever. And then during a lull in conversation, he said, well, Nick, I'm gay. And I looked at him and said, and? And he said, I'll never forget this. He said, I just wanted to tell you because I knew you'd still love me. And we had the sweetest time. Married as a husband. And on the way out, I said, I'd love to meet your husband. He said, I've read what you've written on this topic. He said, I actually agree with it. But it's this cognitive dissonance and Sometimes Christians, rather than the salt in the earth, we can be salt in the wound, can't we? Our folks who know that we disagree with them need to know that we're going to love them anyway. He told me, he said, I know that you believe differently, but I knew that you would love me the same. 
both my daughters are in the entertainment industry. And of course the LGBTQ uh, demographic, or you know, they fill that area, very talented, some of the kindest people I've ever met. Had them all into our home, taking them to eat. There's one young man, I told him, man, I've raised you as my home, just the way you are. Disagreement does not mean hate. But you don't have to compromise your views, right? That's right. That's nonsense. Well, any question or comment about anything? Has it made sense? I hope so. You know, I write all this stuff up and I go, okay, <laughs> here we go. <laughs> Let's see. <laughs> because uh, I heard a guy went to, or I read one time, um, I realize people can come in and, you know, just kind of turn it off and yeah, not really a desire to learn. Maybe you feel like you have to come to be right with God, which is, you know, not at all biblical. But, uh, and so some people, what I'm saying is they have no interest in really learning. But this, this um, wisdom on teaching just has always struck, stayed with me. Uh, it's after we teach or preach or whatever, the question we should ask ourselves is not, was there any great Bible teaching? In other words, well, I hope I did a good job. It's, was there any great Bible learning? Because if nothing's connecting, I've wasted your time. So, if there's ever anything you think I can do better to connect, I don't have an ego, folks. Uh, you just come share it with me. And um, we'll go from there. How about that? You are deeply, deeply loved. There is a ton of coffee back there. There are more donuts. What do you got? I'm glad my mom is here today. Say God. I'm glad my mom is here today. Oh, okay. Well, when I said in-laws. Michelle's mom's here as well. Yeah. Yes, yes. Uh, her dad, uh, He's he was a pastor forever and ever and ever. And um, so he had to go back. They're from Lovington, New Mexico. So he had to go back. He was filling in preaching this morning there at a church in Lovington. Uh, so please, take a few minutes. Love on these people. Give them some cash. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to stand up there too. <laughs> <laughs> Folks, you're deeply loved. Pray about bringing someone with you. Again, we'll get on number two next week. How about that? I think you'll enjoy it. Let me pray for you. God. I pray that you would, God, help us to have confidence in taking a bold and fearless stand for what is true. One Lord, one faith, one God. God, and to be able to explain to people that this is not our opinion, it is what the Bible says. And that we would, um, we would garner no respect for saying we believe the Bible, but not holding to its teachings. Just as a Muslim would be disrespected if he professed to be um, a Muslim and then disregarded the Quran. Lord, the Bible is our sole source. Help us to stand fearlessly for it. Help us to know what it says. Mm -hmm. And then God to speak the truth in love. Always even when it's tough love. God, I'm reminded even now, as you brought to mind, when Paul told the Galatians, have I now become your enemy by telling you the truth? Sometimes. And then, Lord, I pray, God, as you might set up a divine appointment in the coming days or weeks, Lord, as you've taught us this now and you've entrusted with us these biblical principles, should we um, cross paths, Lord, with somebody with a different lifestyle, um, different uh, school of thought God regardless of our biblical worldview and conviction may they know that the uh, peak of that biblical world of uh, biblical worldview and conviction is that Jesus said by this all will know if you follow me if you have love one for another God let them be confused and taken back 
by the boundless love given to us through the cross and then validated in the empty tomb. God, those people we talked about earlier, uh, the, the Buddha, um, the, the Confucius, uh, Muhammad, God, their graves are still occupied. But yours, O oh Lord, is still empty. And we thank you for the risen Christ and that on the cross he said it is finished. This is our prayer in Christ's name and all God's people said, Amen. 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 <laughs> Lord's Supper, coffee and donuts. <laughs> Get your, I didn't get your message until late. I don't know if I'm going to get this back. I'm going to have to go.